Hello everyone, thank you for joining us today in this Istanbul Blockchain Week Web3 Investment Strategies work, uh, dis discussion. Uh, today we have Vinet with us. He is definitely a force in blockchain and crypto ecosystem, managing partner in cyber capital and I don't know, maybe over 100 investments all over. He is definitely one who is shaping the ecosystem. And all, it's always nice to feel the ecosystem around and meeting the new person here you're meeting the new challenges and this kind of discussions and the workshops are giving us to change the, actually our vision for the future and the, the in the web tree it's all all about the changing the future but as far as we all know in order to change the future we need to invest in first and that brings us in today's discussion how the investment strategies are going on in web tree so Vinet, maybe let's start with the first question from, from me to you. How do you think and how do you manage your this managed shift for Web3 and how you are manage this investment, changing in investment strategies? The def definition of success, the metrics, the older artists are changing and how are the venture capitals taking this? Cool. So we, uh, first of all, good, after, uh, good evening everyone. Before I get into the question, I'll just give a brief of uh, what we do at Cypher. Cypher is a $100 million fund based out of Dubai. We have actually done 300 plus investments, not 100 investments. And most of those investments have been in the uh, blockchain space. So, you know, you have projects like Casper Labs that we have invested. We have invested in Sui Miston Labs. In fact, last four projects that got listed on Binance, two of the investments were ours. So uh, that's what we did. You know, we did uh, investments over the last three years. And we're continuously investing right now as well. You know, like a lot of people have been saying that it's uh, the crypto winter. For us, we've been investing three to five projects uh, still. Because, you know, one of the key things that I see now is we're seeing a lot more qualitative people. When you come to this conference mm -hmm. in two years' time and BTC is at $120,000, you wouldn't have a space to even sit down. <laughs> but now you find founders who really want to build something. Uh, now, coming to the uh, thing about investing and how Web3 is shaping up uh, the investment decisions. Now, you mentioned that you come from a, a Web2 startup which has raised money. Yes. Now, understand how, uh, how this direction works. You know, you come up with an idea in Web2, you go to your mom and dad, raise your seed capital, come up with a presentation, go to an angel investor, raise some money, have $100 revenue, go to Vamda Capital, raise a million dollars. Yeah, and long and long and long and conversations going on. <laughs> yeah, and Series A, Series B, Series C, and then eight years later, if you are lucky, you end up doing an IPO. Yeah. And that's when, you know, people, you know, in this process, yes, people get to hear about your companies, people do micro loans from you, you know, people bought a lot of stuff from Amazon before it got listed, people were on Facebook. Now, this is how traditional uh, investing, Web2 investing works. But in uh, Web3, it's a much different process. You know, there might not be a lot of customers and retails comes much faster. You know, people have a, a smart idea where they can build a more user participation, you know, where users can drive the growth, they can own their assets. And maybe in a year or two years, people actually land up getting public to invest. So the whole fundamental change, an eight-year process has been col collapsed into a... Uh, less than a uh, two-year process, and retail comes in faster. So participation from retail gets better. So for us as VCs, what we are seeing is more and more people getting educated about Web3, coming mm -hmm. as investors, looking at the use cases. I would still say that you know there's a lot of noise in Web3 because it's an early stage. Like I, I compare Web3 as the 1980s of Indian stock market where people had no clue what stocks are. Yeah. You know, people would buy stocks based on tips. Today, when I look at the Indian stock market, you know, people understand shares represent the earning potential of a company. So we are early, but you know, these are places where, uh, which is early industry and you should want people should be there. And in investments as well, public is getting much faster access to things. Yeah, it's always when you, when you create your community and you know the people you're around, everything just starts changing and faster and faster. And we can say that the, the one thing could change so fastly is decentralization, of course. And we can say that when it comes to Web3, decentralization is always on the stage, always at the spotlight, at the center of the topic. But as a venture capital, how do you evaluate the extent of decentralization in a project and how this evaluation become a, a let's say, investment potential? 
So again, decentralization is the core to uh, crypto at the moment. You know, Bitcoin was whole launched from the fact that no central agency would own it. Is it completely 100% decentralized in all the Web3 projects that are there? Not really, because you know, today you still have uh, plat C5 platforms which are owned by someone else. But what decentralization is helping is that you know it's giving more power to the people to own assets. You know, when you play a game like uh, you know one of the fire, uh, the, the, one of the games on internet, you know, it's basically owned by a central agency. Every time you have your digital assets, next year when the game changes all your work goes off. Yeah. Roblox, for example, you know, all the revenues of Roblox goes somewhere else. But when you look at Web3 gaming, a lot of these assets, first of all, building the game also requires money, which people are actually investing in and people are owning it up. Then your assets are completely decentralized. You have NFTs where you have characters with them. So uh, decentralization is there in a few, but again, you know, a lot of decision making is still with foundations and stuff like that. For us, is it a key reason to invest? You know, basics of investing everywhere in the world are same. You know, you need to understand what the team is. Do the team have the capability to invest, mm -hmm. uh, to build something amazing? Who are the people backing it up? You don't want to invest uh, in a company that is backed by five people sitting under a people tree. You want Bamdas of the world and you want A16Zs of the world to be there. Whether the project has some real use case, you know. So, but decentralization also continues because then, you know, you see to it over a period of time that and not a single person starts taking all the decisions and uh, you know you have seen the how uh, centralization has affected things like ftx celsius and stuff yes. like that so but yes it's not one of the core components on which we would take an investment decision we can definitely say that of course in the traditional web it was only one way and it was only static and the web 2 it's changed a little bit we participate but we can say that that the web 2 companies let's say that the big giants they just in order to give a bigger more and more they just compromise uh, con users actually the content in some cases data and so that's why the keeping the system as itself has become so important for the for the users and the startups also so we can uh, ask you maybe that as a venture capital, how do you, you said that it's not the, of course it's not the only one, but how do you stay informed and how do you keep yourself updated about it? And more importantly, after you keep yourself updated, how this uh, decentralization of keeping this uh, separate big, uh, plays a role in venture capital? How like a venture capital plays an important role for maintaining and fostering it? So, as you know, uh, the whole thing is how do you get information uh, on these Web3 things, you know, whatever is happening in the world. I think uh, one of the key things that personally I do is being available at every play place and meeting a lot of people. Mm -hmm. See, knowledge cannot be uh, gained by just seeing a YouTube video. Of course. You know, everyone thinks he can become a Warren Buffet by looking at the influencer on YouTube. That's not how things happen. You have to end up meeting a thousand people and understanding that 950 of them are fake and 50 of them are the real ones. Mm -hmm. And that's what your personal knowledge is. You know, I am sure that as a kid, your parents would have told, you know, you need to do a job, understand how people work and then finally set up the business. So for us, one of the things is actually meeting up a lot of people. So coming to conferences like these, going to developer conferences and understanding what are the ideas. There are. There are a lot of uh, industry reports as well, mm -hmm. you know, that what segments will be interesting. Like, you know, you said microfinance. You would have seen that there are segments like last minute delivery, which go hot, AI, which goes hot. So one is going to conferences, second is knowing what uh, uh, industries are happening. And one of the final things that is critical is pair to pair uh, interactions. So, uh, you know, there is a founder who would come, you know, they're in the founder circle, they end up in a dev con and they meet other people who are trying to do smart and then there are these referrals which come up. So actually this whole system builds your knowledge base and gets you the information on what to go in. And I, we coin a term for this known as social capital. That means uh, investing runs on knowledge shared through pairs and this is all the three components. Okay. That's how we utilize uh, our social networks. And how do you play a role in your startups, like in the boards that maintaining that the startups are having a linear growth rate all the time, how they, as a VC, how they're mentoring them? Okay, so I have been doing startups for 15 years. My last startup uh, was valued at $8 million and failed overnight, <laughs> thanks to COVID. I was a travel startup thing. So uh, it's not just that I randomly got money and I started investing. I've been doing startups and you know, my startups were pretty successful. I had Ctrip as an account. I had all the big OTAs in uh, India as an account. So uh, we, 
I personally have seen uh, what a startup needs. Mm -hmm. It's a bit different for a Web2 startup and a different for a Web3 startup because I mentioned, you know, the process of uh, raising capital and landing up in an exchange in Web2 is an eight-year process. Yes. Well, for a Web2 one, it's a two-year process and a much different process. So how we help these companies is first, you know, capital is the key thing, though people say we look at smart investors and then capital is the most important. So capital is one of them. The networks is the second one, you know. A lot of these projects are looking for revenue growth for user growth and they look at other projects which are from our portfolio company so this is one of them this open ad advice you know in any parameters of uh, pr any p parameters of influencers any parameters that they look that we, we help them with that a lot of government regulation stuff also happens mm -hmm. because uh, luckily we are based in uae <laughs> which has very uh, amazing uh, government policies towards these startups so you know when uh, there are a lot of startups who are moving away from places like the us china and they want to land up over there and want to know the regulations so we help them with all those things so you know there, there's a whole set of not just mentoring you know mentoring is 10 minutes of you get sitting with someone and giving him overall gyan but it's what is also required is actionable effects. Yeah, I definitely agree that as a, let's say, one professional in the startup world, I can definitely say that I know in the early days it looks like that the, the investors are choosing you, but actually you're choosing your investor also. And it's not that only putting some money in the equity, it's just being an active board member, mentoring the leadership, even help them the challenges, even also just giving the right choice, giving the right support when it comes to failure. I, I think as a VC company, you are also expect uh, some failures because it's not that, uh, let's say, reasonable to have reasons as one uh, success. So how you actually, um, let's say, support your uh, ecosystem when it comes to failure? How can you, uh, let's say, motivate themselves for the next move? So again, as I said, my last startup failed as well. <laughs> so, you know, failure, we are in an industry where 95% of startups fail. You know, it's, if you go to a casino, you have a 50-50% chance of winning on red on black on uh, roulette. But when you are doing a startup, you have a 95% chance mm, of failing. So, yeah, even, the, even if your startup is a big success, you have like small failures in the, let's say, in the executive section, I don't know, in the operations. So as a, let's say, the uh, professional in the early age, you need to know how to take those. Yeah, so see, one of the things is before the failure happens, there's a lot of mentoring there, you know. Uh, a lot of these founders might be first time founders or might be experienced founders so they, they need a lot of hand holding for example you know how do you launch a so one of the key things that web3 startups wants to do is do a launch mm -hmm. now, if you look at all my investments that we have done i've been telling them that you cannot launch any of these tokens now for the last one and a half years we have asked our startups not to launch anyone who launches is gets thrashed See, because this market is driven by Bitcoin uh, prices mm -hmm. as well. And probably it's an easier idea to do it after six months. But again, a lot of them excited, they launch, fail. But we still handhold them because it's not the end of the journey. You know, they still are building products and they land up. They have to land up somewhere in the next five, six years. But once I have a 30% failure rate, I have a very good success rate so far. But what happens Congrats. once someone fails? You know, there's a whole lot of mentoring where there is other startups which would like to uh, have these roles because at least these founders have learned from there. Uh, second is, you know, can you see to it that you can revive them? It's a very dodgy subject because, you know, once a founder has given up, it's very tough for him to reactivate this thing. But I think the major thing is about how do you place this founder because, you know, he... He's unlucky that the thing didn't work, but he had the courage to build something up. How many people actually leave their uh, high-paying job to set a startup? Very few. But one critical thing about advice is you should give advice where it is needed. Yeah, that's a very good point, actually. Yeah. So I we are a... here to give advice, so feel free to say anything. <laughs> so, you know, the thing is, uh, an investor is not a co-founder. He will give you advice when it is asked for. He cannot call you up and say, do this. And you know, again, the founder has to decide whether he wants to take an advice. If I tell a startup that if you launch in the next one month, this is a real advice and you still launch, it's the founder's call. Good or bad, the founder sort of uh, mm -hmm. takes the brunt out of it. So for us, uh, that's something we do. You know, we actively have open door policies. Anyone who comes to me as an advice is completely free. 
but whether he takes it or not, it's his call. Yeah, and it's definitely understandable. And it's always a good muscle to know that when to ask and how to ask and advise also. So let's t uh, talking about the advisors, let's, I'm sure the, the startups here are also wondering that what will be the one advice that to give the startups when they come and pitch you? What, what, what is the thing that you want to change in today's pitches, let's say? This, the, the advice to startups is from my personal experience. <laughs> Nobody gives you the half a million or a million dollar check at a conference. For sure. Everyone, ev and I too did that, you know, this is a mistake I have done as a startup founder. I would land up at a VC, tell him the whole world out of my project. This doesn't happen, you know, the whole objective of going to a conference or meeting a VC instant is to get the next meeting. Because I cannot, standing in five minutes, I cannot evaluate your startup. The objective is to actually land up the second meeting where there can be a certain analysis. But before meeting an uh, investor, you should be well prepared. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you have just five minutes to pitch yeah, something. Pitch in. your idea. Yeah, and, and a lot of people don't actually have an elevator pitch. They go all around the world talking about everything, but they forget to talk about the problem that they're trying to solve, what they have built, what is the traction they have, and what are they raising they go around showing everything else except these five. So, you know, understand people, when you go to a conference and 30 people are trying to talk to an investor, the attention span is less. Yes. It's like going to a nightclub, you know, when people come to you, just remember the one who's the most smartest and who has, has the perfect elevator pitch. So, thing is, you have to be prepared while talking to him. The objective is not to take money in five minutes. Nobody does that. Yeah, nobody will. The objective is to get the second meeting. Yeah, I, I can totally understand this. The, the elevator pitches are the ones where actually the startups need to work it a little bit because you need to tell your story and you need to your transactions in just three or five minutes to just get the attention of the VC because there are a lot of startups waiting in the line. There are a lot of meetings waiting properly in your agenda. So that's why I can understand this for sure. And, and one, the other advice is that, you know, it's you have up times and you have down times. The down times is all about survivability. We've seen the market has been bad for two years. Mm -hmm. Let's be clear, you know, you have the data in Web2 as well as Web3 that the funding freeze is happening. Yeah, the, 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 the US economy sets all of for us, let's say. But That's even, where Bitcoin is trying to yes. change the whole game, you know, we are trying yes, to decentralize. Yes. Yeah, you need to change it very quickly because the everyone waiting for a, raising an investment. Yeah. <laughs> so the thing is about survivability, you know, uh, everyone talks about having a unicorn startup and becoming a billion dollar startup. But the smartness is all about being the cockroach startup and surviving this one or two or three years mm. to actually gain from the next wave. Because if you're not alive that time, mm -hmm. you're not going to become a unicorn. So it's all about survivability sometimes. Yeah, we can definitely say that. So maybe just the one last advice from, uh, from the, let's say, uh, the leader from the uh, ecosystem to the early, early stage startups. Like, how can uh, choosing the right venture capital can impact their future? How, what are the seeds, from until this point, we always seeing the situation is like the venture capitals are evaluating the startups, but also in the other side of the coin, how can actually startups can evaluate the VC and how how can actually they be right to choosing the right one for their future? Okay, so see, this is, a, this is something that everyone tells but no one understands. As a founder, I was always advised that you need to choose your uh, VC well. Yeah. But you know, when you're desperately looking for money, any money is okay. <laughs> you know, when it you shouldn't act, be, isn't it? If someone offers you a million dollars, will you not take it? A million dollars, yes. But let's say you can, ha if you have your choices, you will need to evaluate them. No, but see, that's if you have your choices. You know, some, imagine when a founder is starting up and he needs that million dollars to really uh, start this thing up and go up. You know, he for him he doesn't think about the other things that can happen. Yes. And this is the way reason why a lot of these startups have also failed. Mm -hmm. But problem is, you know, that's why I'm asking this. Yeah. My thing is uh, why evaluation is critical because you you don't want to take money from someone who blames you later on for, first of all, he comes and makes you run your startup. Like I had someone who told me yesterday that there's a guy who is uh, offering me a few million dollars and you know, this is his idea. I said, he should offer you the money, not how to run the company. So what you have to do is you have to look for money that is smart money that is open to open networks for you. 
open to give you advice when needed, but he should not be the one who makes you run the company because then he's basically making you run the company and, and he just needs a, someone to blame. So you look at smart money, you look at people, like when you said, you know, for example, you said your company was invested by Vamda. Vamda is one of the big uh, Web2 VCs out of Middle East. The founder of Web2, uh, Vamda made uh, Aramex. Aramex is one of the biggest uh, uh, logistics company in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. Now imagine a logistics company lands up at Vamda, the amount of network, the amount of industry knowledge, the amount of connections that you can get. So that is known as smart money. You know, taking a money from one of the businessmen uh, sitting in Dera is not equivalent to taking money from Vadi Gandhur in this case. So you have to look at what other value can he get so that your business can expand well, you know. So that's what I would uh, personally advise uh, startups to do, look at smart money. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. So as a closing remark, maybe you can tell us what's cyber capital's vision in, in the next, let's say, five years. Uh, so, you know, because she mentioned a lot about decentralization. So my tagline that I used to use a lot and which crypto people don't like is we want to become the soft bank of the Web3 world. Now, when you become the soft bank of F3, well, you become centralized. <laughs> yes, it's a, it's a little bit strange on there. Yeah, because, you know, you basically own a majority of the key performing companies. Mm. So SoftBank looks like a, the biggest internet company in the world because he owns uh, ownership on all, all of this. So, but again, this is the necessary evil because, you know, until venture capital doesn't come in, the companies cannot become big. And there is a certain level of centralization that will happen. So for us, the vision is to support uh, amazing startups. Uh, who have legit ideas to build something somewhere, you know. Uh, planting a tea in a tree in Africa and saying I'm using blockchain is not personally for me a uh, blockchain idea. Mm -hmm. Building a platform where lenders and borrowers can come and interact directly through a smart contract uh, and earn interest or uh, get a loan is an idea that doesn't, that requires blockchain, you know, it can be done on a smart contract. So it's all about uh, us supporting great ideas, uh, world changing ideas uh, and the future. And maybe one last question, who do you think that it will be the first unicorn in your portfolio? I have had enough. <laughs> we had, uh, we have invested in say blockchain, which is on uh, Binance, it's valued at one and a half billion. So we have enough, so it's, Again, like <laughs> doesn't matter. So, you know, it's, it's not about uh, sometimes for a VC. So my, our last fund uh, went from $10 million to the peak of half a billion dollars. Mm -hmm. So it's sometimes it's not about money. Sometimes it's about having those which change the world. Yes. So, you know, if you are a founder of Ethereum, you know, we bought it at, you are the investor of Ethereum and you bought it at one cent at $1,800 is not about money. You are the guy who supported Ethereum when it was it. nothing. So it's not about money always for some people because you know you've already gone through that. Yes. So for us, it's about winning, uh, investing in game, world-changing ideas. So thank you for all your comments. I mean, it's very nice to have you here. So let's Thanks. give a big applause. Thank you, guys. And see you next year, hopefully. See you next year. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Thank you. Bye bye.